Hey everybody, Scott Detweiler here. Today we're going to be talking about Capture One's color management solution. So there's a lot of tools inside of Capture One and you're going to find that as we look at different interfaces, yours may not match mine and that's all fine, but the tools themselves will always work no matter where you put them. Uh, to move tools around inside of Capture One, you can just grab the bar um, and move them around. And if you want to add or remove them, you just simply right click on one of the bars. You can add any of the tools or remove any of the tools and you can create tabs and, and really get the interface that works best for you. And then you can save it up here under workspace. Uh, it comes with a lot of nice default workspaces and you can see I have a few here um, over the years that I have kind of created and to the point where I'm, I'm very happy with the way that they're organized. So uh, color management in Capture One can be done a lot of different ways and there's a lot of different tools and much like Photoshop, there's a thousand ways to make the same thing happen. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about some of the best practices that I have found inside of Capture One. Uh, but again, these are not rules. They're much like guidelines uh, or advice that I have because I've been using this product since version six and I know it pretty well. And uh, there's still some things I discover from time to time that I didn't know. Uh, but for the most part, uh, I think Capture One, although its interface is a bit confusing initially, is a much more powerful application. And obviously with that power comes complexity. Uh, so looking past that and looking at each tool individually makes the product a lot more approachable. Uh, so I have, I've looked at the uh, exposure uh, tab up here. I'm going to call it a tab. Uh, and there's, there's obviously a bunch that come with it. And, and you can put whatever tools you would like to over there, as I discussed before. Uh, so I have my histogram on here um, because I like to see the type of data I've collected. I'm trying to always shoot as far to the right as possible because remember half of your image data is stored in the far right stop here. And you got a quarter, an eighth, and a sixteenth. So obviously uh, one stop underexposed uh, is going to be a bit noisier image when you try and magically add data later. Uh, that's not exactly what's happening there. Uh, the product has to do some, some fancy math to make it happen and you're gonna get noise in the shadows because that data was not captured. Uh, so this is a pretty good looking histogram and I'm happy with the exposure straight out of the camera. Um, uh, what I can do is I can uh, hover over her skin, for example, and you see over in the curve area or the histogram or the levels even, that, that gold bar there represents the spot that I'm hovering over now. If you're a fan of the zone system, you know that Caucasian skin is about a stop over 18% gray, and that's exactly where we are on this line. So her skin is good to go, and so I don't need to brighten or darken this image. In my opinion, this is what I consider to be a good exposure for skin. So uh, let's talk about color management. So uh, there's a couple of best practices for Capture One that in general, you don't wanna work on the background layer. So the background layer allows us to do everything in one layer, and this is pretty much exactly the, the feeling you have in Lightroom. If you do everything on one layer, it's exactly the same as Lightroom is going to be. Uh, but the beauty of Capture One is that we can create different layers and adjust their opacities in case we think they're a bit aggressive. Uh, so let's create a layer here, and we're gonna, you just click on the name here, and we're gonna call it Color, and we're gonna try and do all our color adjustments on this layer right here. Now, if I grab my curve and I make adjustments, you can see that nothing happens, and it's because this this layer has no mask. It's not affecting any part of the image. If I hit my B key for a brush, you can see I can draw that and then I can adjust this curve that way. If I need to mask her out for some reason, so I can create a mask around her and then you would use your brush tool to go in and kind of fill in all that stuff. You don't have to do that. You can just go here and do fill mask and now it'll fill in everything for you. Uh, so. I'm gonna clear the mask and I'm gonna invert the mask. So now the whole screen is filled and any changes we make are global. So uh, we're ready to go. Now, uh, I'm not gonna really cover the exposure, contrast, brightness, and saturation sliders uh, because you should pretty much under understand these from Lightroom. If you don't, I can probably make a separate video on this because things like the nuances between exposure and brightness, for example, are probably worth a video on their own. Uh, but each tool inside of Capture One has its own hamburger menu here. That's what that's called and it saves uh, different presets that uh, come with it. And you can also save your own user presets um, here uh, for specifically that tool. So each tool can have its own presets. Instead of having one master preset, which you can also create, each individual tool can have its own presets. And I'll show you uh, later on how I have one specifically for eyes, for example. Uh, so uh, high dynamic range, if you're doing anything uh, where you're trying to recover any highlights or any shadows, uh, that's me in here. Uh, again, I'm not really going to be playing with that video or playing with that menu today for, for the video. Uh, and then the curve. Now, curves have a play in color. Uh, obviously, we can, we can adjust our colors based on just the curve. So in the blue layer, 
Um, if we want to introduce a yellow cast, we can pull this down. We we'll introduce a blue cast. We can do this. So now we've introduced a blue cast in the shadows and a yellow cast in the highlights. Um, you can do this a myriad of different ways. Uh, it really depends on your style and what you like. And um, I mean, there's no right or wrong way here. Uh, color is color, and it's uh, going to appeal to some people. And and your goal is to come up with uh, your style, and and your style is basically what you like and enjoy. And if you produce images you enjoy. Uh, and they're consistent in their look and feel, you're going to have your own style. So I would tell you not to uh, rely heavily on plugins and say, I I represent my style as uh, number 83 from this mega pack that was normally $14,000, but I bought it for $18. Yeah, I'm, I'm number 43. That's my style. Uh, I think each image has its own feeling, and I like to play with the colors for each individual image. And I'm going to show you an easy way to do that in Capture One, so you're not spending a lot of time doing that. Uh, anyway, this functionality is available inside of Lightroom as well. Uh, and again, you have uh, your different menus here for saving presets and, and using things. If you don't like what you have, you can hit this here to reset the curve. Um, you can also hold down your Alt key. So if we make a decision and we want to hold down our Alt and click on it, it will show us a temporary uh, before and after. So remember, you got to hold on the Alt key. Not very intuitive, but uh, it's consistent across the product. Um, you can also grab the eyedropper and uh, pick a point on which you want to adjust the curve. Uh, again, very similar to Lightroom. What you notice is different about Lightroom is we have a difference between luminosity or luma curve, luminosity curve, and an RGB curve. Uh, so this is kind of interesting when you look at um, the difference between a contrast in luminosity and a contrast in RGB. The luminosity one is, is not pumping up the saturation when it's brightening the image where the RGB one is changing our contrast a bit. This luminosity curve is not something that's available inside of Lightroom. It is a capture one thing. So we deal with curves most of the time as RGB curves. So uh, this is kind of interesting and uh, you'll probably find you prefer one over the other. Um, you might even prefer the contrast of the RGB. Uh, but the luminosity is supposed to be adjusting only the brightness of the image. It's not supposed to be enriching the color, uh, which is something that may be undesirable. Uh, so that is here, and again, you can adjust your curve colors individually. This is not a way that most people do it, and uh, frankly, it's not the way that I tend to do it. Although I have been known to mess with this um, for color, it's not how I prefer to do it. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna say this is this is good to go, and I'm gonna collapse these uh, so I can make room. Uh, the Next color variation is actually gonna be in my color menu. This is the only thing on the exposure menu that I have that I use for color. Now there's levels down here, which is kind of the same creature as curves, and you may have a preference over which one you prefer to look at, uh, but they do basically the same thing. Um, you can adjust your, your high points and your low points for your white points and all that kind of jazz, or where your gray, your, your mid gray value lives, and so on. Uh, but again, that's for another day. So let's look at the color menu. So in the color menu, you see I still use my layers palette at the top. Uh, I, I like to have that pretty much at the top of most of my working palettes because I do use it constantly. And you see curve is also on this screen. I did that for the sake of this video, but normally curve would not live on this screen. All right, so the color balance tool. This is probably the one that confuses people the most. And when you come upon it, it's probably looking something like this. Now you can break this into three different ones if you would like. So you could have, you could add another color balance tool and you can have as many as you'd like. And you could set this one to say midtone, and you could add another color balance tool and you could set this one to the uh, highlight. And there we go, I've created this monstrosity and you could even drag it out. So if you wanted to create a floating menu of just your um, highlight, midtone, and shadow, there you go. And you could dock this somewhere or move it off to another screen. Um, it really depends on, again, how you want to structure your interface. Uh, there's really no right or wrong reason. Uh, for the sake of this video, though, I think I'm gonna leave this around so we can play with it and you can see it. Um, so let's start talking about the way that Capture One approaches colors a little bit different than the way that Lightroom does. Uh, so in Lightroom, you basically have a shadow and a, and a highlight uh, slider and there's a it's a little graph it pops up i don't have lightroom installed actually or i would show it to you uh, but you have uh a, it starts at the bottom with no saturation and goes to the top at maximum saturation and then your different colors across that so you click on a little square and you would adjust it in capture one it's kind of the same idea we have um for this is in the shadows only 
uh, we have this, which will adjust just our shadow. So I tend to move this around until I find something I like. And uh, it's going to vary from picture to picture, in truth. I mean, shot this outside, I do tend to prefer um, a little bit colder tone in the shadows. It's my personal preference. I may draw my, uh, my studio partner nuts that I like that, but that's what I like. Uh, so over here, you have the brightness, or say the uh, value of that. And over here, you have the saturation of that. And you notice how it, it moves this circle depending on what it is that I'm doing inside of there. So I can kind of create which part of the image I'm adjusting and how much saturation it's gonna have as well as its warmth or what have you. So what I tend to do is move this around until I say, you know, I'm kind of making smaller and smaller circles like right in here. I think this is kind of where I want it. And I'm gonna leave it there for now. Now the mid-tone works the exact same way. Uh, this adjusts the mid-tones of everything. And I don't tend to find personally that this needs to move very far, if at all. Uh, so I may push it a little bit toward the warmth, especially if there's a person in the shot. And again, you can Alt and then left click on this to see a before and after. Uh, and that's adjusting all of these, by the way. So uh, we can kind of see what we're looking at. And then the color balance for the highlight. Uh, so again, the highlight here. Uh, again, this is a slider that I don't tend to play with most of the time. I just leave it where it is. Uh, so let's say I, I like this, uh, and just again, personal preference. Uh, so let's just dock this and collapse these. Now there's one other part of the image uh, that we haven't talked about, and that's the white balance. So the white balance, uh, pretty obvious tool. And I haven't retouched this image at all, so uh, sorry, Cecilia, for this. But So uh, if I don't have a white card, I can just click on the square of her eye with the white balance tool, and I'll, I'll get a rough approximation of what I should be looking at. Um, I could also find some white on her dress and so on. But you know, when in doubt, most people have eyes. Uh, you can go for the eyes to kind of get where you want to get. Um, this is just a, a rough way to do this. Um, now let's talk about one other color balance here. We have these three. There's one over here called the master. Uh, so master is more or less the global warmth for the image. Uh, and this is how you would adjust, say, everything. So shadows, highlights, mid-tones, all kind of play second fiddle to the master. So um, I tend to start with the shadows and do master last. And I don't really know why I prefer that method, but that just seems to, to, to feel the most natural to me. So I'll get what it is that I'm looking for this way. And uh, then if I need to go back, I can adjust each one of these. That's why I don't keep multiple copies of the color balance tool hanging around because you can switch it uh, at any time to any one of these or view all three at once. Uh, I find these too small. Um, so I just prefer to just click on it and use each one. Uh, now the uh, theory, color theory, uh, would say that you would want opposing mid-tones and shadows. In general, I find this to be true. Uh, if my shadows are kind of living over here, I know that my mid-tone or my highlight or even my master is probably going to live over here. Uh, and sure enough, the mid-tone that I found I liked and the master was also pretty close. And you could probably say, you know, to be completely anal about it, you know, it should be exactly opposite. I don't know. But in general, I find this rule tends to stand pretty true. And I find myself often, if I find a highlight I like and the shadow isn't quite right, I'll go back and look and see, are they opposing each other? Again, I could be completely wrong about that, but in general, I have found that to be pretty true when it comes to color balance. Uh, so again, the color balance is being done on its own layer uh, and it has an opacity. So if I wanted to, when I'm all done, I could come back and say, you know, it's just a bit too much. Um, I, I want to bring that down a little bit. Uh, so the opacity of each layer can be adjusted individually. Uh, we still can go back and mask this. You can hit the E for the eraser and it works just like Photoshop. You have your left and right brackets. Um, you can also right click and adjust the size, the hardness and opacity flow, which is a godsend. Uh, you can use your pen in uh, Capture One. So you're, if you have a Wacom tablet and you would like to, you may certainly use your pen to uh, even retouch if you're into dodging and burning, for example, dodge and burn can be completely done inside of Capture One um, in a myriad of different ways. Uh, but mostly you, you would create layers for your, your dodging and burning individually and then mask into them uh, with a low flow. So um, I'm not going to that. I think if you don't get what I said, we'll do a video on it at some point. But if you didn't know you could do that, now you do. All right, so uh, that's this color tool. And uh, that's typically where I would stop um, for most portraits. Uh, now, as far as workflow goes, this step is the last step for me. 
Um, I'm already done with Photoshop typically. This is an already retouched image and I don't color tone it first because if the client comes back and says they say, for instance, like my old studio partner, they don't like cold in the shadows and they like warmer, a warmer image overall, um, I would have to go back and start from scratch again if I did the color balance before I went into Photoshop and did the skin. It means I have to do the skin again. Um, what if they? What if I want to make a black and white variant, for example? You would obviously do the black and white after you have it retouched, so you have a black and white and a color. It's no different than that situation. Retouch first, color balance second. Uh, it, that's my advice and the way that I've done everything, and it has saved me numerous times from clients that maybe didn't like uh, something, or if I wanted to uh, harmonize the colors across an entire set of images, I can do that secondarily. Um, same with presets and things like that. If you're, if you want to, you would apply those presets to give the clients a bunch of variations. Um, if you're into that kind of thing, you would always do the skin first. So just have to say that because you may think, hey, I'll adjust the color first. I would highly recommend you don't do that. You do that secondarily. Okay, uh, white balance, I'm not gonna really kind of bang on that because most of you should know what white balance is. And uh, white balance is not part of your raw file, it's part of your sidecar file. So if you're shooting raw, this is completely subjected to change at any point. Uh, and if you're only using one, one light source, then it really kind of, your white balance is inconsequential for the most part. Now I did shoot this outside near sunset. Um, I had a color temperature orange on my strobe and I was using some ambient light as well. So um, I did pay attention to my color balance um, or my white balance and uh, I'm happy with what I, what I have there. Uh, Normalize, I'm not gonna really talk about too much uh, today. This is a tool that is uh, amazing. Uh, instead of just white balance and picking a specific image, you can pick any color in an image and then have that color be matched identically on every other image. So if there's a dress that is a specific color according to a designer, even if the white balance is wrong for the picture, I can normalize that dress across multiple images. So this is a very cool tool, again, that is exclusive to Capture One at this point. Uh, we have a black and white uh, capability down here, and it works, again, very much similar to the way, I'll move it up a little bit here, the way that, that Lightroom works and that you just enable black and white. And then you can adjust each of your tones individually. Uh, double clicking sends that the counter back to the middle where it should be uh, if you don't want to make any changes. And you can you know do whatever you want to do. Again, there are presets uh, that you can come up with um, or you know borrow from uh, wherever you would like to get them from. And you have split toning as well. So if you would like to introduce a hue um, into the highlight, for example, um, you can certainly do that to create some sort of a, a dual tone. Uh, again, that's personal preference and not something I tend to lean on. I am not much of a black and white guy, uh, but uh, if you were, uh, there are some wonderful tools in here for that. Uh, clarity I'm not going to touch on today. You all know what clarity is. White balance and then the color editor is the last part. So the color editor is kind of a beast unto itself. Uh, so let's start that adventure. Okay, to uh, kind of talk about the color editor, we're going to break it down into three pieces, basic, advanced, and skin tone. Uh, so for the basic editor, you're going to have to be on the background layer uh, because the background layer is where the image lives and the color layer obviously doesn't contain an image, it contains adjustments. So the background layer, uh, we have all, all kinds of crazy stuff going on here. So let's kind of break this down. Uh, the color wheel is breaking down your colors, uh, you know, your blues, your teals, your magentas, cyan, and so on uh, across this. And the current color, if you pick this little color picker and pick it, it will show you where that color lives inside of this wheel. Uh, so our lips, Sorry for all the noise there. Um, so each time you click on this, uh, the image someplace, it's going to tell you where that color lives in the color wheel. Uh, now, you see these hard lines here. We can move these to say that we're looking to adjust this wedge of the pie. So uh, more green and uh, maybe take me in this direction. And then how hard of a line is it between this wedge and the, the wedge we're not really selecting? That's what the smoothness does. Um, and then... We want to shift the hue of this green, for example, we can move that this way. Now, unlike Lightroom, there are not tremendous swings available inside of the hue slider. You can't take it from green all the way over to run to blue. It doesn't go that far. It's gonna move in in increments of about a third. So if you need to do this again, you actually have to create another color picker, I mean, another color editor and continue moving it around. Uh, that's just by design. It's not really supposed to be used as a heavy lifter. 
the saturation of the color that we're looking to adjust. Uh, now, if you're having trouble understanding what it is we're changing, you can actually view this down here and it's gonna turn the image black and white except for the areas that we are affecting. Uh, so this gives us an opportunity to play with this wedge to see things around. It's like, for example, we don't wanna affect her hair and her skin, so we can't really have this wedge be used, but we also don't want uh, to ignore, say, this tree a little bit. Um, so I'm just kind of adjusting to where I think I want it. Uh, then I can uncheck this box and it's showing me the before and after color. So this is the color we're changing to this color. Um, and you can see that working in the leaves in the background. Uh, so I may need a little bit more of this to affect this green over here. Uh, the saturation of that color, um, you can guess what that does. So if I want to make it black and white and come up with some sort of strange, terrible uh, selective color thing, you could do that here. And then the brightness, overall brightness of that green color. Uh, so maybe in this case, I like it to be a little bit brighter. Uh, so that's basically how the color, color editor works. And you can pick each color. So if we want to go for the blue, we can just select it down here. Or again, you may use this tool uh, to select it. And uh, as long as it's in a different zone, then you can adjust it independently. So if we pick her uh, dress, for example, here, this blue, then we can shift, color shift the dress a little bit, but not as obvious. So we can again, check this and see, but just kind of affecting these flowers here. So not a very good selection. How about the teal? The teal is even more of the flowers. Um, let's look at the reds. Uh, so reds would be her face, her complexion, her lips, and so on. Uh, so if I wanted to affect that, I could do that from here as well. Uh, but uh, there's better ways to do that. Um, so we weren't we aren't going to really play with skin at this point. But anyway, so you get the idea. You can use this picker to pick it, show you which part in the wedge it's going to appear in, adjust your borders if needed, and uh, then adjust the smoothness or the transition between these borders. Uh, so if you're looking for a hard stop, meaning I don't want her red lips to be affected by her skin, then you could come up with that narrow band uh, on this wedge that would affect just that color. And again, you can have as many as you would like, uh, but note that you are working on the background. So um, it, it is uh, not as flexible because there's no specific layer for the color editor. Um, this color adjustment is a separate layer. Uh, so that's how the basic editor works. So each each layer can have a, a delta or you know change in hue, saturation, and luminosity uh, per your major colors. And then obviously this is the master as well. So it's affecting all of the areas uh, in general. And you're only really allowed to hue shift the whole thing um, or uh, change the saturation of the whole thing. Uh, I don't tend to use this tool at all, uh, but that's um, up to you. Okay. Talk about the advanced editor. So the advanced editor is a very similar creature. We can pick a color and rather than basic where it shoved us into a specific place and said this is the area you're going to be working in the advanced editor says this is the zone around where you clicked and notice this is the amount of saturation of that so toward the middle of the circle is less saturated toward the outside of the circle is more saturated so her skin probably lives in this little triangle and if we're not sure again we can click this box and sure we can see that we can adjust this until we get exactly where her skin is. Again, we're not gonna play with skin in here because there's a separate thing. You see skin tone right here. You know where we're going. Uh, this this allows us to adjust the saturation of the select of the selection we're looking at globally, of uh, the smoothness between it and the areas next to it. So uh, how much of that we wanna do. And the hue uh, allows us to shift the hue of the select area. Again, saturation and lightness, you know how this is going. Uh, so. So that's how that works. You can also move the point that you're selecting, um, but I don't tend to find this to be as handy. I, I tend to like to try and find it in the image. Uh, so I would use the view selected color range, click the color that I want. It says, this is about where I clicked. And then I can say, I want that hue to be over here. And then if I need to, I can fiddle with these to get what I'm looking for. Uh, I'm looking for more green in this situation. So I move it this way uh, to try and get what I want. You can't move it past the point that you're that you selected, uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, down here, there's some other tools too. For example, if I meant to pick everything else except that zone, uh, then I can do that. This allows you to push it all the way to the edge in case you meant the entire wedge of the pie and not just the smaller part. And then in here, now I can add layers. So I can add individual color adjustments and then adjustment upon adjustment upon adjustment until I'm happy with what I want. Um, you can see here the kind of the rough color that I was playing with, like here's the, the somewhat greenish color. 
here. Um, here's the somewhat orange color here. And you see there are no changes to these, so these did absolutely nothing other than demonstrate the fact that you can edit pretty much anything you'd like to. Uh, up here, you can save your presets. And then here's some, some presets to say that if you're looking for uh, some terrible, <laughs> absolutely terrible selective color nightmare, they're up here ready for you to go. Um, they're just here to help you select those colors so you can leave them as a point of departure. But again, you're probably going to use this eyedropper. Pick a spot, we'll say the green leaf, and then say it's going to say, okay, this is about what you're talking about. Now, I care about the most saturated greens as well, so I just pick this, or I could slide it all the way to the edge. And then I can adjust the hue or lightness um, of whatever it is that I want that lives in this range. So you can see here that I'm trying to make sure I catch all those leaves in the background by moving it uh, farther. The smoothness is important here because if it's not smooth, I may come up with leaves that are partially uh, switched and there's like a, almost like a hard line between those changes. So I tend to use uh, quite a bit of smoothness in here. Um, and that's, uh, that's how that advanced color editor works. Uh, and once you understand that you use this, the eyedropper to get where you wanna go, adjust it within these tools and then create these layers. I think it's a pretty simple tool uh, to understand. The view selected color range is also a godsend. If you can't really understand what you're looking at, uh, just makes everything else black and white except for this affected area. So you see like her hair is colored here. That means that we're catching too much of that. Uh, we need to move this over so we're more green if we're trying to affect just those leaves. Uh, so now those changes make more sense. Uncheck the box and then we can adjust our hue as needed. And again, you're seeing the before and after colors down here so you can quickly identify what color changed to what thing. Uh, and get exactly the look that you're looking for.